Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It is so good to see each of you this morning. The light of Christ is indeed shining on you, and we are grateful to be worshiping here together. We would like to know that you are worshiping with us, so if you are here in person, I think perhaps those little black pads might be back in the pews, and you could take those and register your attendance and pass that down to your neighbor. You could even peek to see who it is that is your neighbor if you don't know them and maybe talk to them after the service. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? I think that would be a great thing to do. And if you are worshiping with us on our broadcast or online, you can go to fumctupelo.com forward slash I'm here and let us know that you're worshiping with us this morning. Very good. And also, if you are a woman and would like to be a part of a woman's Bible study, there happens to be one going on right now. Well, I mean, not right now, but like in this season of time we're calling summer. Uh, Carla Garrett is leading this study on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock in the gathering room. If you're not familiar with where that is, well, it's behind us. Go through these doors and go back there. It's back there somewhere. It's right there. It's where you got coffee. Does that help? That's where it is. That's a women's Bible study. Also, do you like to greet people? Are you an extrovert? Then you would love to greet people, right? Of course you would. We're a room full of introverts this morning, I guess. But if you would like to be a part of our greeting team, we would love for you to do so. You can go to the church's website. Again, that's fumctupelo.com. And there is a sign-up link there on the church website. And finally, uh, Mary Strickland's last Sunday is next Sunday. Boo. I'm not happy about that. But anyhow, next Sunday is Mary Strickland's last Sunday. And I know that many of you would love to contribute to a love offering that we are taking up in her honor. And you can do so up until the 17th. If you are uh, writing a check, you can just mark in the memo for Mary Strickland. You can write there Mary Ward if you'd like to, but Mary Strickland is you know, probably a little bit more accurate. But we'll go with either one and she would be uh, happy we're we are sad that she's leaving, um, but are grateful for the good things that God is continuing to do in and through her. That is a little of what is going on in our life together as a church. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship.
Let us rise. happens to the best of us. Now we can all rise and join our voices as we say together our call to worship. God interrupted Samuel with an unexpected call. Here I am, Lord, send me. God surprised Jesse, choosing his youngest son, David, to be king. Here I am, Lord, send me. We join with Christ and are a part of God's new creation. O oh, mighty God, we come to join the harvest. Gather us in, O oh, Holy One, for we would be your people. Amen.
Let us pray. Help us to walk by faith, O God, not by sight. Be our vision, Holy One, for without vision your people perish. Remind us that you do not see as mortals see, for you do not judge by outward appearances, but look on the heart. Amen. Let's join together now in the Psalter. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your victory and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I am the Lord will help this anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses, but our pride is the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call. Good morning. I'm good morning. <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> um, I'm Polly Bailey, and I've been a member of the Methodist Senior Services Board for many, many years. And I'm here to talk to you today about one of its most caring features, the Sunday Fund. Senior Services maintains 12 campuses in Mississippi. You're all familiar with Traceway in Tupelo, but there are 11 other campuses and they are all innovators in senior care. The first greenhouse in the United States was built in Tupelo, and now they're all over the country. Senior Services has, a Sunday fund, has had a Sunday fund for 55 years. I think the Sunday Fund is one of the most critical parts of this care. Our campuses house some 1,800 residents and, has, and they, there have been as many as 10,000 over the years. Because of Sunday Fund, not one resident has ever been asked to move because they've outlived their financial resources. Think about that. Not a single person has ever been asked to move because they've outlived their money. That's where the Sunday Fund comes in. The money is critical in helping folks who otherwise would have nowhere to go. 100% of the money that is donated to the Sunday Fund goes to help our elders. Listen to this resident's letter. My name is Billy, and my apartment is the one with the big blue bow on the door. I'm so thankful for the staff here for being so kind to an old forgetful man. I'm sure that the blue, big blue bow is there because I keep forgetting which apartment is mine. I have no family, and I finally used up the money from the sale of my house and I only have a small income from Social Security. Because of the generosity and donors to the Sunday Fund, I have been able to stay in my home. Thank you. 
Our church is second in the conference and was second in the conference in 2020, giving to the Sunday Fund. Second, and we don't like to be second, <laughs> do we? Amen. But we've been first for many years, but we need to do better. There is no better opportunity to respect our elders and provide for their happiness than to give to the Sunday Fund. Please consider a gift. If you would like to contribute today, just put it in the offering plate with designated to the Sunday Fund. But next Sunday, there will be gift card cards in, located in the pews and brochures that will be handed out for you to see. You can always mail your gift. Remember to put Sunday Fun on your check when you, or, or envelope. Please think about Billy and the hundreds of other people who need our help to stay in their homes. Uh, running out of money is the, one of the greatest concerns of elder care. On behalf of Billy and all the deserving elders and Methodist Senior Services, I thank you in advance. Reading from 1 Samuel 15, 34 through 16, 13. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, and Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king of Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to you the sacrifice. And he sanctified... Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, 
because I have rejected him. For the Lord doesn't see mortals, see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us bow our heads, please. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for this day, for all who have participated in our services, from the youngest to those who are more seasoned, and we just thank you for the laughter and all who gather today. I ask and pray, dear God, that as I come now to preach, that you would give me the strength and courage to do your will, and ask and pray that it is not my will that is done, but yours. I ask and pray this most humbly now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We have begun a sermon series entitled Stories from Samuel. And every so often we'll be changing the cover of the order of service or the bulletin. Uh, if you look today, you will see that there is a picture, a graphic of a person holding a shepherd's staff and the sheep with the shepherd, perhaps representing David. On last week, we began with the story of the children of Israel and how they demanded a king, even though God told them that they did not need a king, but they kept demanding a king. And so Samuel, who had been chosen by God to be a prophet and a leader of the people of Israel, felt rejected. But the Lord told him that they were not rejecting him, but instead they were rejecting the Lord himself because God was their king. And so they kept insisting on having a king, and so God told Samuel to anoint Saul. And Saul was anointed king. He was tall, he was handsome, he was charismatic, he was a warrior, and he was anointed king. But we shall soon see that everything that God warned the children of Israel about began to happen with Saul in leadership. For God had warned them that if you have a king, rather than me, the king will take all of your sons and send them off to war. He will take your daughters to serve in his kingdom. He will take the best of your crops and your cattle and sheep all that you have, a portion of it, will belong to God. But Saul messed up. Saul got in trouble. And God removed the mantle from his head, the crown from his head. God told Samuel that Saul would no longer be king. And the story we just read Samuel went to Jesse, and he anoints David as king. 
There's a portion of that scripture that we read today which says this, and this is the title of the message today, comes from this. 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord does not see as humans see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. Looking on the inside. Looking on the inside. We live in a country, in a world where, particularly in our country, we spend a lot of time and money on our outward appearances. The beauty industry, if I had known about the stock market when I was younger, I would have invested in beauty products and perhaps would be rich now, Joe hair dye. We spend a lot of money with our doctors to have plastic surgery. In our society, being young and handsome or beautiful is where it is. And we all get caught up in it. The most beautiful and the most handsome people are those that we seem to admire the most. That if you have physical beauty and appearance, that you are admired in our country and you are uplifted. There was a study once, I don't know if it's still true, that those who were elected to public office and those who were in leadership in business, for the men they were over a certain height and for females too, and that even if you did not have the gray matter up here, Jimmy, that if you looked the part, you could play the part. You could fake it until you made it. Some parts of the world, growing old is considered a great achievement, that if you have no hair like me or if you have gray hair, you are considered wise and important. You are uplifted, but not in our society. Our society seems to put that down, and we look on the outside rather than on the inside. Last week I read, and Jimmy was so impressed with this, that great theological treatise, The Wizard from Wallaby Walla. (laughs) And you remember I read the story about the little mouse and how the mouse was unhappy with his life because somebody was always trying to kill him. They had traps with cheese on it and they tried to trap him. They tried to shoo him out of their houses. They put cats on him. He did not like his life. He wanted to be anything other than this little mouse. And so he went to the wizard and he got one of the bottles that was unmarked. And the bottles had pills in them. And the wizard was getting them all in alphabetical order. You could take one of these pills, you could turn into an elephant, a tiger, a bear, or whatever. But he gave the little mouse one that didn't have a label on it. And the little mouse asked the wizard, what will I turn into if I take this? The wizard said, I don't know and don't care and slammed the door on him. The mouse went home and all that night he he dreamed of taking that pill and turning into something else. And if you were to remember the story, the next day he came back to the wizard. He knocked on the door. The wizard opened the door. He looked at the little mouse and he said, you've changed. He said, yes, I have. And basically he had decided he would be happy with who he was. Even though he was short, had big ears, a long tail, he decided that if he were a butterfly, he would die quickly. If he was a bird, he had to eat yucky worms. If he turned into a cat, he would eat his fellow family members. So he decided to be happy in who he was. The wizard was excited and he says, the first time one of my potions has worked, he changed. And then all of the people in the town heard about it and they came to the wizard, they got the bottles, nobody ever took any of the pills, but they changed being happy with who they are. In this life, so often, we look on the outside rather than the inside. One of my classmates who is a judge in the Jackson area, classmate from college, 
put a quote on Facebook, I had to find it, and it says something to this effect. If you're a slim or skinny, people will say you're starving yourself. If you're obese, people will say you need to lose weight. If you have gray hair, people will say you're getting older. If you color your hair and dye it, people will say you're trying to act young. If you dress up, you're acting conceited. If you dress down, you let yourself go. If you speak up, you're being rude. If you don't say anything, you don't have any backbone. You see, in life, so often, we look on the outside rather than on the inside. But I've come today to remind us why the outside is important. It's what's on the inside that's most important. You see, Saul was tall. He was handsome. He was charismatic. They tell me when he spoke, people just bowed down and did whatever he said. And when he began to be king, he was humble and respectful. He was brave and courageous. But they said power corrupts, and absolute power absolutely corrupts. When he became king and he began to win a few battles, he took credit for it all. He said he went up to Mount Carmel and he built a monument to himself. And he said, I have done all of this. And only later did he think about God when the priests who were supposed to pray for them every time they went to battle tried to pray the prayer. Saul shooed him off, said, we don't have time for that. We have to go and fight this battle. And then in his arrogance, God told him to destroy all the Amicalites, every one of them and all of their crops, and even kill their king. But he did not do it. Some of you who are very sensitive would find horror that God would tell somebody to kill everybody. I found it disturbing myself, and I had to go and do a little research. Jimmy will correct me. I was in his Sunday school class this morning if the research was incorrect. But the research I found said this, Jimmy. It said that this command to destroy all of these people goes all the way back to Moses. So these are the people who were mistreating the Israelites when they were free from bondage. And they were an evil, sinful people. They had sacrifice of children. They sacrificed their own children. They would not accept God as their God. They did all sorts of things that were evil and wrong and immoral and unethical. And God was afraid that his people, being human beings, would be around these people and would be influenced by them. And in fact, years later they were. Queen Jezebel and others are examples of how this happened, and they began to have other gods. But what Saul did was he spared the king. I guess he was thinking about himself. They got all of the gold. They got all the best crops. They, got the, they only destroyed the stuff that was no good. I have a sermon entitled, That'll Do. I need to preach it before I leave here. It's, in, it's not in the lectionary, David, so I'll have to have a special day to preach it. <laughs> but that'll do means that we give God the leftovers. And that's what Saul was doing. And then when Samuel heard about it and he came and confronted him, Saul did like Aaron did when he built the golden calf. He said, they made me do it. Have any of you all ever done that? I've never done that in my life. (laughs) It's easy to blame somebody else when we're caught in the wrong. You see, Saul was caught disobeying God, and as a result, God removed the crown from his head. He said, you will no longer be king. 
God frustrates me sometimes, irritates me. Dave, do you want to see the looks I'm getting now? Oh, I'm getting the same <laughs> looks here. Uh oh, I can't escape it. But to be honest, God does. The reason being, God does not do things the way I want God to do things. God does not see things the way that I see things. If it were me, Saul would still be king. He could command the military. He could win battles. That is who I would want in charge. If I pick people when we have lay leadership committee meetings and we try to pick new leaders in the church, so often as a human being I'm looking at how eloquent they are, how well spoken they are, what leadership abilities they have. But I am reminded time and time again some of the ones that I did not think could make it turn out to be some of the best leaders in the church. And the reason I was speaking on Jimmy this morning, he led an excellent, Jimmy Curtis, he led an excellent Bible school, Sunday school this morning. And in there he talked about a number of things. But I was reminded as I heard him talking that God is no respecter of person. He talked about John the Baptist, how John said that he was not worthy to stoop down and untie the sandals of Jesus' feet. And he talked about what was on Jesus' feet. And it reminded me that as a human being, so often I look at what's shiny, I look at what's beautiful, I look at the outside, but God wants us to look on the inside. And I don't know about you today, but I'm so glad that God is able to look beyond all of my faults and to see my needs. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad today that God is able to forgive me of all of my shortcomings. I don't know about you today, but I'm so glad that even though I no longer have an afro, I used to actually braid my hair. They didn't believe it. Eh? I, can, I know how to braid it. There's nothing here to braid now. Amen. It's all gone, but I'm so glad that God is able to look beyond the outside and look on the inside, and even on the inside, I have a lot that's wrong and ugly, but God is able to forgive me and look beyond all of my faults and to see my needs. I don't know about you this morning. And David Dillard, I'm about to do. David told me, say, Ember, you have a hot mic. And what we discovered, SPRC chairperson is here, what we discovered is this. He looked at the other mics of the other preachers. And what he in essence told me, sometimes remember, you get excited and you get a little loud. <laughs> and so I'll try not to get too loud today. But I'm excited today. I'm excited today because in my human frailty, and my sin, and all the things I've done wrong, God is able to look beyond all of that. And I've come today, I won't be much longer, to remind you of something today. You may not be the most handsome person in the world or the most beautiful person in the world, but ultimately all of us are going to lie in state somewhere and some preacher is going to stand up and say words over us. And when the preacher gets through, as I heard years ago, they're going to go back to church and they're going to have potato salad. <laughs> but when the preacher preaches words about us, yeah, David gets it, gets it now, okay. <laughs> when the preacher says words about us, or your friends get up and say words about you, and I've had many funerals, the people whose lives I'm most moved by are not the ones with the most money, the biggest houses or the biggest cars or the most beautiful or the most handsome ones. The ones that I'm most moved by are the ones who have a heart that, like David, 
is right with God. And so, we're getting ready in just a moment to sing a song. And that song says, Lord, I want to be a Christian. And so while we're singing that song in your heart, in your soul, and in your mind today, if there's something in you like it is in me that ought not to be there, when we're singing that song, I ask and pray that you would realize that God is looking on the inside and he can take all of that out and he can change it and make it more like God. If I had time this morning, I would place my hand on each one of your heads and remind you that you are loved by God and that God loves what's on the inside of us. Let us bow our heads. Almighty and everlasting God, come now, touch and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Remind us, dear God, that it's what's on the inside that counts. As we stand prepared to sing this song, remind us, dear God, that we want to be more loving, more kind, and more caring in our hearts. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We stand, please. be seated. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God, as we find ourselves here in this space this morning, 
whether it's physically here or if it's at home, wherever we are this morning. Lord, let us pause and let us remember your promises. Lord, you are good. And as we sit here and abide in your presence for just a moment, let us linger and reflect on your goodness, Lord. Lord, we are in awe of who you are. As we reflect on that you are the God of peace, the God of harmony, the God of redemption and restoration. Lord, fill each one of us with your joy, with your passion. Lord, with passion not only for life, but in life eternal. Lord, in passion because of the work that you have done. Lord, you are creator and sustainer. And we worship and celebrate you today. Lord, we have erred and strayed from you like lost sheep. We have not always been your obedient church. Lord, in the ways that we have intentionally and unintentionally rebelled against you, we ask for your forgiveness. Lord, in the ways that we choose to turn our backs and run the other way, Lord, that you have pulled us back. And we thank you. Lord, that you have offered us your forgiveness and you have reconciled us when we did not deserve it. Lord, that this is an ongoing process in the past, in the present, and in the future. Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we thank you. Lord, there is great need in our community and in each, in our, each of our lives. Lord, I ask that you draw close particularly to those who are um, suffering, those who are sick, those who are grieving and mourning. Lord, that your healing touch, your presence of peace, be just that. Lord, that you are with those in need of you. And Lord, on that same idea that you are here with us, because we're all in need of your presence actively. And Lord, we thank you that you offer that to us. Lord, fill each one of us with your spirit and sanctify us as we sung the words, as we sang the words just a few minutes ago, that we be, ma be made more holy, that we become more loving, Lord, in your image, as we are transformed deeply by your grace. And now let us pray as Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as the forgiven and reconciled people of God, let us offer God's tithes and our gifts.
us pray. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to render, to render to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you, not with our lips only, but with our whole lives, turning the duties, the sorrows, and the joys of all our days into a living sacrifice to you, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we prepare now to leave forth from this place, as we prepare to sing our hymn of commitment, perhaps there's somebody here today who would like to rededicate their lives to God, or perhaps there's somebody who would like to unite with this church, or perhaps there's something heavy on your heart. During the singing of this song of commitment, we invite you to come forward uh, to accept Christ in whatever manner God is laying on your heart. Amen. Hear now these words as we prepare to leave. And now, dear God, may the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit abide and be with you all for now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.